Hello and welcome to another episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. Today we have part five of our masterclass series that we're doing with Kai Whiting and Leonidas Konstantikos, authors of Being Better, Stoicism for a World Worth Living In. And you can find the link in the show notes to where you can go and buy that book. Uh, And I highly recommend that you do. These guys are very, very knowledgeable on uh, especially orthodox stoicism, you know, the real uh, uh, nitty gritty uh, understanding of uh, this ancient philosophy. And so today what we were discussing is this idea of character. Uh, And yes, character development, but also uh, what we discussed mostly in the first part of our conversation uh, it was kind of the stoic metaphysics of character. Uh, so this was actually one of my favorite conversations so far that we've had in this masterclass series. And uh, and we continued the conversation a long time after the initial conversation with myself and Kai and Leo. Uh, and so if you would like to find all of the conversation, just go to patreon.com forward slash Simon J. E. Drew, and you can listen to all of it there, including all of the questions that our wonderful Patreon members asked uh, after that first part. And I do want to say before you listen to this interview that I do apologize uh, for the audio quality on my end. Uh, Unfortunately, I couldn't get my microphone to work during this meetup group, so I was just using very old Apple headphones, and so I'm sorry for that uh, if it does get annoying. But nonetheless, I hope that the content uh, of what we're talking about uh, makes up for that issue. So, without any further ado, I want to let you in on this conversation with Kai and Leo on Stoicism and Character. So, uh, today, everybody talking about character, um, might say character development, um, but I guess we're having an even broader conversation about what it even means uh, to, you know, you've talked in the past, uh, both you, Kai and Leo, about this idea of the character uh, thickening or the soul thickening or, um, you know, and the Stoics obviously held character in a very high place in their philosophy. And I guess I wanted to start by saying, um, you you know, one of the first introductions that I had to uh, philosophy ever was actually listening to the, the great personal development guru. He wouldn't call himself a guru. Um, Jim Rohn. I don't know if any of you have ever listened to Jim Rohn, um, but he's just one of these people who's just very, um, uh, you know, he was probably involved in a whole bunch of network marketing things and stuff like that. But nonetheless, like he, he really, um, he was interested in giving people practical wisdom for their lives that could just help them to live a good lifestyle and, um, and have a sound character. And one of the things that he always said, he said that the the major determining factor of your life of how it will turn out is your life philosophy. And that really gave me um, pause to, you know, to think and, and think, okay, well, what is a life philosophy? What does that mean? You know, and, and uh, you know, I also remembered another person who I listened to who said that information changes situations. So I started thinking, great, okay, I need to read more books. I need to read more philosophy and figure out what this actually is. And then when it came to the Stoics, it seems like the Stoics took it a little bit further and said, no, 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 your character is the major determining factor of how your life will turn out, right? Or, or not even in a material sense, but in terms of your inner flourishing. And it seems like character is, is better than your life philosophy because character is your embodied life philosophy. You know, it's, it's the proof in the pudding of the philosophy that you claim to have. So, you know, it's not just speaking words, it's who are you really? Um, and this is this is what shows up. So I think that the, the Stoics were kind of pushing us in that direction to say that the, the truly good thing is a good character. And I wanted to read something from Epictetus before we dive in here and let Kai and Leo um, jump in with all of uh, their wisdom here. This is one of my uh, favourite passages from Epictetus. Uh, if you if you want to read this version, it's uh, on, the, on the Art of Living, Sharon LaBelle. Beautiful, beautiful uh, collection of his, his writings. So, um, so it says here, true philosophy doesn't involve exotic rituals, mysterious liturgy, or quaint beliefs, nor is it just abstract theorizing and analysis. It is, of course, the love of wisdom. It is the art of living a good life. 
As such, it must be rescued from the religious gurus and from professional philosophers, lest it be exploited as an esoteric cult or as a set of detached intellectual techniques or brain teasers to show how clever you are. Philosophy is intended for everyone, and it is authentically practiced only by those who wed it with action in the world toward a better life for all. That's kind of what I'm getting at with this idea that it's, philosophy is only truly practiced when it's wedded with action, and that seems to be the development of your character when that happens. He says that philosophy's purpose is to illuminate the ways our soul has been infected by unsound beliefs, untrained, tumultuous desires and dubious life choices and preferences that are unworthy of us. Self-scrutiny applied with kindness is the main antidote. Beside rooting out the soul's corruptions, the life of wisdom is also meant to stir us from our lassitude and move us in the direction of an energetic, cheerful life. I'll pause there. I just think that that passage um, can really teach us a lot about Epictetus's priorities, right? And, and, and also it can teach us a lot about character because what he's talking about there is character development. You know, it's taking the wisdom in philosophy, wedding it with action toward a better life. And, and on top of that, the, 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 what, what's, what's the right word? The, the system by which he wants us to do that is something that I've told every single one of my clients who I've ever worked with. And the system is, self-scrutiny applied with kindness, right? Um, and I just think that this is a really important key to throw in here is like whenever we're developing our character, I just, I've seen this in my own life. I've seen this in the life of my clients and, and other people. When you have a little bit of scrutiny, looking at your character and saying, you know, what, what am I doing wrong? But also a little bit of kindness to give yourself that forgiveness when you mess up. Um, man, that sort of, that sort of system just works wonders. Um, and so I thought I'd throw that out there just as a little bit of practical wisdom for how we can develop our character. But then I want to throw it over to Kai and Leo to talk to me about the specifics of what the Stoics said about uh, character development and why it's so important. So uh, I'm going to throw it over. Uh, Kai or Leo, whoever wants to jump in first, um, I guess tell me a little bit more about uh, what the character means and is to the Stoics. Okay, well, um, first and foremost, let me let me know if my how my internet is doing because I'm trying something else because I had a problem they were checking last time. So just let me know if you need me to switch over to a different one. Okay, promise me that you'll tell me so that I, I don't uh, I don't get lost. Um, no okay, so excellent. So um, about character, I think I think what's important about the Stoic view of of character is that they're a very physicalist philosophy, right? So when we talk about character, when we we so often we tend to think, okay, well. What is your, you know, what do we want to know? What is someone's worldview? How do we see the world? And for the Stoics, I think what, what they do so well is they get that, even if we can't agree with everything in the metaphysics at the end of the day, that your character is a physical thing, right? Your nature, your soul, that is a physical thing. And it depends on how, like you said, how thick it is, how thin it is, what is its tension uh, with everything else around it, right? So virtue or that uh, comes from character is the way that your soul is in tension with everything else that your body is doing, right? And you're, because your soul is a body. And the Stoics have several syllogisms to prove to you that this, your soul is a body, right? It's a physical thing. Um, where we, we the, the thing about the, for the Stoics is we don't develop conceptions and preconceptions until we're, depending on the source for them, until we're either around between seven and fully by the time we're about 14, right? So you're not even really a person until you're, imagine that, you're not really a person really until you're 14 because to start that you're developing like your conceptions and your preconceptions that you can like um, check your impressions against, right? So until that time, you're just kind of trying to figure it out. Where we screw up, the Stoics think, is that because the entire world is run by idiots, right? It's run by fools. It's run by, by bad people, right? Um, where we screw up is we come into this world and we get, we get axiology put on us by other people. Even with their best intentions, you might say, you still get their axiology that um, war uh, the warm blanket is good, right? The... Um, that um, pain, that, you know, that burning yourself with a fire is bad in itself, this kind of thing. Or, you know, what I call like a, the RoboCop 
imperative when he says, hey, what's your advice for children? Stay out of trouble, <laughs> right? To just stay out of trouble as a good in itself. And that's the way you should behave. Always stay out of trouble. And this, we get this axiology put on us and it's corrupting, the Stoics think, which even if people have the best intentions, they will corrupt you. So the point is for the Stoics, to, and uh, the point for the Stoics is to develop these kind of conceptions and preconceptions that are so, um, you know, that, that on, you know, on, at the at, at your best, it's like hand over fist science, right? It is this, the episteme of, uh, you know, grasping things, uh, things that are right and things that are they're true. That's what you want. Um, very few of us can develop that. E and even the sage for the Stoics, who has the firmest soul, right, will still have what he calls the flutterings, right? These pre-emotions, these pre, you know, ha having spent your whole entire life as a fool, you're still going to have this, you know, natural bodily reaction. And, and that's okay. You want that. You want the natural reaction to, to, um, you know, uh, to find caution and things, things like this, right? You don't, you don't want, you want your brain to be uh, working, you know, working correctly, but um, character, what I think is most important in a stoic view is that um, it must be a physical thing because to say that, oh, well, you know, this person's worldview, this person's worldview, as we, like we say it, I think if there's one thing we can take from Freud is that we often don't know the, what, where, are, you know, what's underlying are some of our actions, some of our concerns, some of our feelings. And the Stoics, you know, say, look, forget about, you know, the, the world, worldview can be compatible with many, like the things I do might be compatible with a Buddhist worldview or a Christian worldview, but that's not the Stoics point. It's not about your worldview as such. It's to have you develop the kind of physical body, right? This kind of physical soul, you are, these neurons that will fire correctly every, to the extent of your ability every time, 100% of the time. And as if we'll, you know, if we can have a chance to talk about it later, it's probably not a chance to get too far into it now. For the Stoics, there's also a question with the early Stoics, whether this can be lost or not, right? So we might think today, if someone has a traumatic brain injury, right? Uh, are, is this, you know, are they now, have they lost their good character, right? Um, the Stoics were divided on this one. So someone like Cleanthes will say something like, no, you're, the, the character of a sage is so tense and so firm that it cannot be lost, right? Uh, not even with, uh, with, in drunkenness or, you know, in depression. Whereas someone like Chrysippus will say, no, it can. If you, you know, if you're, well, we might now say if your brain isn't functioning correctly, well, there's just no, you know, you're no longer the sage. Uh, now we can talk about how this, is, this goes, but I think this brings up interesting points, right? Uh, I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah. Can I, can I ask one question here? Um, <clears throat> I guess I, 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 I'm really thinking about this idea of the soul being a physical thing or the character being a physical body. And you mentioned that the Stoics had many ways of talking about how that is the case. Um, I, I want to throw out something that I've been thinking about a lot in the past probably six months or so, maybe a year. Um, something that actually was a major shift in my perspective um, and perhaps this is somewhat the way that the Stoics saw it, maybe not, maybe I'm just crazy, but um, I guess, you know, it's understanding the infinite dividability of matter in life, right? In that, you know, when, when, I, when I was growing up, you know, we're obviously taught in, in school, it's like, okay, the atom was like the, the smallest substance that we found. And it's like, uh, you know, um, but then... Then I started thinking, well, hang on, it's the smallest substance we had found at one point doesn't mean it's the smallest substance. <laughs> you, then we have quarks, you know, and then, you know, we, we've got other things below and below and below. And it, just because we haven't found them yet doesn't mean that it's not infinitely dividable, um, which in a sense means that even the thoughts that are kind of flowing through our mind, uh, it, you know, everything can be seen as physical if we recognize that it all flows into this infinite dividability. Um, indivisibility is probably the right word. Um, and so that really just got me thinking. Um, it, it just made me think, is this idea of the thickened soul or the thickened, um, you, you mentioned, uh, what was the word you mentioned? Uh, something to do with a strengthened soul or something like that. You know, Seneca talks about how wisdom is to uh, desire the same things and to avoid the same things, meaning having a solid set of principles that guide your life that are almost unmovable. Um, I, I wonder if you could expand on this idea of the soul being a physical body or the character being a physical body 
as well as you know the, the strengthened character. Right. So I don't know. Now this is off the cuff here, but I don't know um, to what extent there is overlap. But I th- it seems to me there's some overlap here with this um, with something I think it was Galen Strawson, uh, you know, paper he came out with that. Uh, you know, that if you look at the way um, you know the, as time is such, right, that there is just maybe the self, right, might just last as long as a thought lasts. Right, that might be what a self is, and then the next thought or the next slice of time, whatever that is, might be that another another self. That's one way to solve this problem of identity over time. Sounds and horrifying. I think it's <laughs> gone. <laughs> right, right, if you think about it, like that might be what a self is, and then the yeah. self just is gone, and then you have another self there. But I think that this is quite like the Stoic philosophy in some sense. For the Stoics, for something to exist, it must be a body. So what is that? What follows from this? The past does not really exist. The future does not really exist, right? So the only thing that exists is the now, right? The the matter of the universe now and the reason flowing through it. Through it. So in that sense, the the self is basically just uh, you know, there is no first. There is no hard dividing line between your self as such and the rest of the cosmos or whatever. But what your character is is this. In this moment, the slice of time, which is the only true reality, is um, a, a sage's character is a thing that is acting appropriately right now and and cannot help but act appropriately because of its fittingness, right, and its consistency with everything mm. else, right. Now, so I, I think just, that's one way to look at it. Yeah. Can, can I jump in there because you talk about um, you know there's no difference between uh, you know the self and the, the greater cosmos. You talk about I don't know if you said exactly that, um, but Essentially, is it this idea that we've talked about before, you know, had this sense that, you know, as you go deeper and deeper into the Stoic philosophy, what will eventually happen is perhaps you will find yourself dropping out the other side into the oneness of everything, meaning uh, meaning you recognize your interconnectedness with everything in the cosmos. Is that similar to what you're, you're kind of talking about? Right. So, um Look, I think this is a kind of thing where if you ask a hundred people to interpret this, you might get a hundred different a- answers, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and let's and let's be clear. I mean, the, the people that the, the Stoics that wrote about this the most aren't really extant, right? I mean, they're the sources like are very few. So we kind of have to like go from the later sources about what they're what they actually thought, what they actually said. And different Stoics went different ways with this, right? Mm. And yet through and through, you get their view that the, the past is no longer the past does not exist, the future does not exist what exists is a now we are all a part of it the cosmos is the thing that exists at the very pantheistic view of the world right mm. and um we are we are the univ- we are the low part we are the lowest experiencing this from each of our perspectives as it were but like you said there's a sense in which the more the stoics uh you know especially you get in, in marcus this view from above right yeah. that you just see the when, when you start learning we start doing you know, philosophy, when you start progressing, you see the, just the entire cosmos and you no longer see yourself just as this one individual thing. It's almost like Schopenhauer's philosophy in, in some mm. way. I see a lot of overlap, not to say that they're the same, but that's, that's, one, that's the way I like to look at what the Stoics are saying is just like, if nothing else exists and now we can't say, oh, about the, that's why the sage doesn't feel fear, right? Because there's nothing to be afraid of. There, mm. The future doesn't exist. The past is gone. The, the, the sage cannot feel free, feel fear, right? And cannot and cannot feel. I cannot worry. I mean, it can have caution, but well, doesn't have this fear of the future because the future will never come. It's all about the now, and they have the kind of character that cannot do otherwise. Right? Mm. Mm. Yeah, Kai. It's up know. to you. It's up to you. Sorry, it's up to you how much yeah. you want to believe this, right? It's up to you how much <laughs> you think this, the Stoics are right. But I, that's what I'm getting from there. I don't see any other way that you could carve this up, right? Mm. Yeah, certainly. And and Kai, I want I want to let you in here as well if you've got any thoughts that you want to add to this. I think this goes back to when people say, you know, about the self. Well, Kai today is different to the Kai 10 years ago, right? And we often think about that, you know, the sacrifices that present Kai has to make for future Kai, right? Mm. So we understand that. So for me, it's not so hard to say, where is this overlap? How can we say there's no, you know, there's there's not a distinct line between, say, you know, my mom and me. Well, there was a point where there really wasn't much of a stick line between my mom and me. And then where is this distinction between, you know, Kai five years ago and Kai in five years' time, right? I always have to think in my circles of concern of a Kai that doesn't exist yet, right? Obviously. 
Others I'd be leaving a very hedonistic lifestyle, right? Like, yeah, like there's 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 no tomorrow. So I wouldn't say that Sage like is not aware that there's no tomorrow. Of course, that's why we're not consequentialists, but we're obviously going, okay, what is the likelihood of such and such a thing happening? So I I don't think what I just want to clarify to the you know the listeners that Claire's not saying that the Sage is like, there's no such thing, it's never gonna happen because I'm, you know, in in some sense, it's a sage going, well, you know, the, tomorrow will take care of itself because I'm going to act appropriately now. So it's not like tomorrow will take care of itself because God will do something or something else will get in the way. It's like, if I act appropriately now, there is nothing better I could have done. So yeah. tomorrow will take care of itself. I don't know if that, that's helpful because I don't want people to go, yes, so therefore I shouldn't care. I should go out and do whatever I want because there's no such thing as the future and there's no such thing as the past. So there is no such thing as the past in the sense that I can learn from it. And I can understand aspects of the future because there are repetition, right? Stokes weren't so weren't so foolish as to say, well, I can't possibly decide what's going to happen tomorrow because tomorrow is not even existing. No, that what happened yesterday does give me indication of what may happen tomorrow. So it's not a case of like, let's just throw all caution to the wind. That makes no sense. Again, to be cautious is not to be fearful, right? Mm. So the sage is, is one such... Uh, we often say in contemporary stoic circles, be courageous, but it's not about being courageous. It is literally sculpting a character that cannot do anything but be courageous, right? Which mm. is different. I'm sure like uh, Marcus, our Marcus here today, he doesn't want his son to just learn, okay, I should be courageous because dad said that's good. It's like, no, I want to teach you so that when I'm not in the room, you're still you know, acting in an appropriate manner. You're still acting with courage. And it's not that you just copying what I said, like, oh, it's crazy when I didn't eat an ice cream, for example. I didn't mm-hmm. fear for the fact that I didn't have an ice cream. No, you, he would like his son to consistently behave that way. So I just want to also clarify that with character is consistency. Mm. Anybody can be anybody can be courageous by accident. I mean, I can think of many occasions of accidentally being bold, right? Not courageous in the true sense that my character is not such that. If it happened to me again, but I was feeling slightly tired, I wouldn't be able to come up with the same kind of character response. So I, I do like the fact that character is important, that it is something that is we cultivate, mm. we trim and we sculpt. It's not something that we kind of leave to absolute what we might call chance, because you have to say, yes, the future, there will be things I can't control, but I will be st- I will be still stern in my character. I will still fit with the, you know with the with the, with everybody else uh, because i have the logos i will be reasonable so i will be flexible but i will always maintain reasonable because a lot of people think oh so you will always do the same thing over and over again because you know that's what's reasonable no well, it depends right so again mm. with the consequentialism it's like it matters because of what will happen it's like say no it matters now what will happen later isn't isn't relevant because it doesn't exist what happened yeah, yeah. what happened before you should learn from but it's not particularly relevant because that was not the character that's not the character you have now yeah well, unless you're a sage i would say well it depends it depends again if you can the sage lose them lose themselves so i i would say for example if a sage was involved in a car accident i personally couldn't say that the sage's character you know good character was maintained it depends what part for me personally it would depend on which part of the brain was impacted because some people lose the sense of who they are the complete inhibition and you can take certain not even illegal drugs certain medication and you act in a completely different manner and i would say at that point you know if you're taking let's say a painkiller you can start to really need that painkiller and you may not know what's in that painkiller and then your whole character is shifted so mm. I, 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 I don't think the Stoics, no, we know, I don't think the Stoic we can say, no, the sage would always be a sage regardless of what we put you know, in their body. I, can't, I don't think scientifically we can say that. Mm. Right? But I would say, okay, of course, if I drug the sage, the sage is not going to act like a sage. The question for the Stoics is though, but did you really take, you know, did you really take who the sage was? Because it would be difficult. I think that's the line that Leo and I have always discussed. Like, well, where is, what does the sage really mean? Right. So mm. that's a, I guess that's another one for somebody else to solve. But Leo, I don't know if you can kind of talk about the kind of conversations we have about the sage. Wait, theme. before Leo comes in, I have to, I have to jump oh. in. All right. Get out of here, Leo. Oh. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, uh, no I, I have to jump in because Kai, you jumped past a thought that I think was 
really, really important that uh, has really been on my mind a lot. And it's this idea that if you take care of the self right now, if you take care of your character right now in this moment, and that's your focus, at the same time as you do that, you're taking care of every single other potential version of yourself in your life. And the funny thing is, like, this is, this is an idea that I only truly fully understood to the extent that I understand it because it needs to be acted. And I've, I've been trying, you know, I've been really trying to put that into my life. But um, I only really got that idea when I heard Jordan Peterson talking about it in relation to the Sermon on the Mount. Because just to show how you can't divorce Christianity from Greco-Roman philosophies, you know, this very idea is embedded in the Sermon on the Mount and this idea of sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, right? Um, and there's a whole bunch of beautiful verses there where you see Christ talking about this idea that if, you, if, you, if you're truly aimed at the highest possible good, that would be... Uh, a, to, to the Christians, it would be like a communion win, with God, you know, in the kingdom of heaven, right? It's like, if, if I can just aim at that all the time, and if at the same time you're presencing yourself in this moment and worrying about the particulars of this moment and this day, right? At the same time, you're going to be taking care of everything else because there's there's no difference between taking care of yourself truly now and this situation, tending to the part of the garden that you can touch right now. There's no difference between that and taking care of every other time. And so I think this is like, it's, it's a truly revolutionary idea that once we really understand it, it's like, man, why am I, why am I worried about what's going to happen tomorrow? Take care of what's happening right now, you know, fix up this situation, this relationship, this moment. If I can do that, everything will flow. And it's not as if your life will turn out exactly yeah, this is the thing. It's not as if your life will turn out exactly how you want it all the time, but it will happen exactly how you want it in that it will be the best possible outcome that you could have if you're aimed at the highest good and acting in this moment. And it's not just like, hey, just be in the moment, man. It's like, this is a serious, like amazing, revolutionary idea. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there that it's, I've been really playing around with that idea and I can't, I can't break it, you know, it, like I can't break it and say, well, yeah, I should worry, but yeah, it's no. Anyway, I wanted to throw it over to you, Leo, because I know Kai was going to bring you in there and I, I just rudely <laughs> interrupted you no, with my no, terrible character. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, was it was perfect. great that you jumped in. I think that, Leo, if you could clarify Simon's point from a stoic perspective, that would, and then you can talk about how we throw about those kind of ideas when we think about what a sage yeah, you know, mm. how we should see the sage in that sense, knowing what we know about the brain. Yeah, uh, good, good question. Um, again, those are all good questions, and I don't know, right? So I can just <laughs> tell you like what what I can infer from what the Stoics are saying. Okay, you um, don't. What are we here for? <laughs> <laughs> right, I don't know why I'm here. Yeah, I'm learning from you guys. So, like, um, what the interesting thing that you brought up, you brought up, uh, brought up Christ, right? And I, I think this is this, this got me thinking of the um, character as role, right? Because what it seems to me what is right for Christ's character, like assume that everything is true, right? Assume like a whole sermon of the mastery. I'm going to just take it for granted that it is. I'm going to take Christ's character as doing what is right every time for Christ, right? So when Christ says, um, do not resist an evil person, right? Like not even in self-defense and not even in other defense, right? So when Peter, um, when, when Peter picks, uh, takes a sword to defend, uh, defend Christ, I was like, what are you doing? No, I, I didn't ask you to do that, right? So how do we apply it? Is it okay for, us, for, for Cato to do this? Is it okay for a, a Stoic, you know, Marcus Aurelius to do this? So to me, part of this, the importance of, of a good character also depends on, on, you know, the Cicero's four roles or what Epictetus is talking about roles. This is, I think, inseparable. I think this is. I think this is an important part of it. Now, um, do, do you just before you move on? Do you mean that in in terms of we we should ally ourselves with a certain set of ideas given by a certain sage in our mind from the part? Like what? It just expand on that a bit more, if you could. Oh, right. So I will say that it doesn't. I won't tell you what I think. I'll tell you what I think the Stoics are. Each you know particular Stoics are saying. There, Seneca might agree with you in a sense that like you find someone who you really admire. Yeah. And from this person, you kind of blow up the good qualities and you're like, okay, that's, you know, like that's how you act. Or some of the, Sto some of the, uh, some of the Stoics will talk about like Spartans at Thermopylae, right? Like if, if you are in this situation, 
and you are defending your first your cosmos and then your country, that's how you die. And we set this example literally in stone, right? Go tell the Spartan stranger passing by, right? So on and so on, because that's how that's an example for you. That's how you die. Even if they weren't really sages, even if King Leonidas and the Spartans weren't really sages, because it's not that they, if I if I'm a Stoic, right? I would say it's not that they knew what was good and bad exactly. It's that they they thought that going back cowards without their shields was worse than dying with their shields. So mm. we can see this is very bold and we want to say brave, but they weren't sages. So they weren't brave capital B. And yet we can pull from this, this great example of how you should watch how men should die. So to speak, if you're, if you're of this kind of mind, so we, we, this would not have been a good example for Jesus Christ. Right. Mm. So there's a different, there's uh, you know, there, there is something else that, his example. So you kind of pick one, what is, what is right for your nature? Seneca would say, Seneca was big on this, like finding what is right for what, what fits your shoe as uh, mm. Kai and I talk about in the book. So um, there is a sense in which Kai, a char- like, like, like y'all was saying about character being like the thing that you have to work on in sculpt, but, and Seneca also has a point about how we actually give more credit to the person that has to work with the harder substance. Like a person that works with clay and makes a beautiful statue, good for you. But you already had the kind of nature that was guiding you towards it. If you got to sculpt it out of rock, well, then you deserve a, an applause, my friend, because, you know, mm. you had to work with a harder substance. Now, so me, back- is that, are you do mean to say that as you strengthen your character and as you, as you become, say, wiser, more courageous, more virtuous, these sorts of things, it's going to get harder and harder and harder to to make uh, even even more progress because it's like it's just getting uh, more and more compacted and and uh, like like the rock sort of thing. Good good uh, good question. That's not where I was going with this. Okay, I, cool. Seneca, but it's not a, it's not a bad point. But what Seneca's going with this is that some people's natures are just more inclined to, to virtue than others okay. to some extent, yeah, right? Some sense. people, yeah. yes. Look, and and I don't. Who knows if it's if he's talking about nature itself or just the way they were up, you know, their their upbringing until they start falling into stoicism. But remember, the sage doesn't need stoicism. Mm. We do, right? We we chumps do. So someone like me, let me let you guys into my life a little bit. Like I have, I come my my grandparents and great grandparents. They come from a long line of vendetta culture where they just build towers in southern Greece and shoot at each other, right? <laughs> and so we're we're a long we're on two generations away from building towers and in, in 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 Mani Greece and, and shooting other Greeks. Where, where even the Turks were like, yeah, we're not going in there. These guys are crazy, right? And there's nothing to steal, so we're not like let them kill each other. And I'm still two generations away from that, and still like I come from an upbringing where like your enemy is your enemy until he is dead. You know what I mean? And yeah. it, I'm the one that needs stoicism to get for, after 20 you know after 15 years or so to get me through that and i still like people it's things that don't bother other people i see that they bother me and i'm very lucky to have found stoicism mm. whereas some of my some of my kinsmen have not and you see it right mm. so it's me for me and i'm not saying i'm i'm light years from from sagehood right but i've had to sculpt in this sense i've had to sculpt my my material here was rock, whereas somebody else's might have been clay or wood, right? Now I understand where you're going with that. Yeah, and and I, I think this is this is also something that um, has has been on my mind is this idea of just how just how much of my nature is uh, <laughs> pushing me in these directions, and it's like it's it's all <laughs> it's all my nature just pushing me. Like, you know, if, if you really look back at the logos of your life and, you know, you, you start to realize, oh, yeah, I, I was born into this world with a certain nature and even, even just understanding that you can predict reliably whether somebody will vote left or right uh, in their political leanings based on whether they're more conscientious or more open in their big five personality traits that should be like a horrifying fact for everybody, um, <laughs> and, and it is true. Um, and and so you know, just but it's also helpful to understand that. I think that it's really helpful because then you can start to say, well, look, character is malleable. You're given this kind of set that you, of of your nature, but nonetheless, we can still develop ourselves and 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 try to you know use as, through stoicism, for example, reason or um, you know better judgment, discernment uh, to try and yeah f- 
it sounds like what you're saying is if you've already got that strong nature, it's kind of like, oh, let's kind of push the, you know, push the character in a different direction here. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, sure. So uh, what you also got me thinking about was how, like, even though if by nature, if that is a thing that by nature, some of us lean more right or lean more left, I think the Stoics would accept this and just say that, look, this is where God has made you in some certain sense. So the, the cosmos mm -hmm. has made you in, in some sense and not others. But that doesn't mean, like, like we I think we talked about last time, how it's important to have friends, right, that can help you see a different perspective. For example, like in academia, I have a whole different set of colleagues than I did when I was in the military, right? So mm. I might hear someone like someone say now, oh, how why did the police officer shoot that man? He only had a knife, right? And some, you know, whereas whereas someone like me, you know, if I'm talking to my other colleagues, where we would say something like, if someone's in within 20 feet of me with a knife, you're lucky if I tell you twice to put it down, right? So the question becomes the, it's as if the Stoics understand that some people have different characters, and that's okay because that allows us to have different points of view and and got, have the cosmopolis working from somewhere. That's why it's a cosmopolis, right? It's not just mm. the solipsist as Descartes, Descartes' reality, and you know, just alone by yourself. I think the Stoics say, "Look, we all we have different characters, but that's okay. You can you can definitely screw that up, and we all do. Mm. But there's a you can be more like." If, if Jesus were a, a Stoic sage, right, and sometimes he, he sounds quite like it and sometimes not, he would not be the, a stage the same way as Cato would. He just mm. he just wouldn't, right? They had totally different personalities. What's good for Cato to do is not what's good for Jesus to do or someone more like Seneca, right? Mm. Mm. Yeah, and, and I, I just I, I think this is a really important point that you make of stepping back and recognizing that uh, the cosmos is doing its work when it gives certain natures around. Yeah, and I, look, there's no difference between what I'm saying and say, saying look, God's doing his work when he's giving everybody these different characters and putting it all into this big plan, whatever, you know, like uh, you can take it how you want. But even just thinking about, you know, one of the things that I've been really thinking about lately, and this has been so useful for me to actually understand is that uh, most people who start companies, for example, high trait openness because they're highly creative and trait openness is uh, is linked very heavily to creativity. So they're the ones who are going to come up with the new business ideas. But then you really need highly conscientious people to come in there and run the companies because they're the people who are going to be very detail oriented, very happy to do repetitive tasks, very happy to chase after the results because that's just the part of their personality. And I've been thinking about that in relation to myself, recognizing that I'm I'm, I'm a highly open, I think I'm like 93 or 4% open percentile, whatever it is. But And so understanding that actually got me to see, okay, there are people out there who will do jobs that I hate much better than me. <laughs> and I want them doing those jobs that I hate much better than me so that I can do the jobs that I love that they need much better than them. And you start to see that yeah, there's a real logos to this whole system here that, that is flowing around. We need people voting right. We need people voting left. We need that balance. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to tip in one direction and take us down a horrible path. And so it's just funny how you even see that oh, maybe the founding fathers of America figured something out when they said we need like we need the people who are interested in keeping tradition. We need the people who are interested in breaking tradition. And if we do that together... So, yeah, I just think it's important to realize the, the, the truth of what you're saying here and that there's, this is so interesting just to recognize that there's, there's parts everywhere that contribute to the whole. We're supposed to fit into our character 2.0, you know, <laughs> our character plus whatever is better. If, is, is that essentially what you're saying? Yeah, like Heraclitus, uh, going back to Heraclitus, he says even the sleep are doing their part. For the mm. for the cosmos, right? So even in sleep, you're all everyone's doing their job, and and Marcus plays on this as well, like echoing off of uh, Heraclitus when he says, "Look, everything is doing its part. The bees are doing their part. The the birds are doing their part. I'm this guy's doing his part. Even by being a scumbag, this guy's doing his part. He's because he's, he's he's a bees. part in the <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> so Sorry, yeah, I, I don't know why I brought that up. Get it going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I think that that um, we. So another another thing, like uh, to give you, I'm, I'm letting you guys into my life a lot uh, 
uh, a lot today, but on, another one of my, my army buddies, like a brother to me, we're in the war together, but he has very, very right wing views, much, you know, that, more than I do. Um, but he's, he'll say something like, I don't, I don't want them teaching that America has made mistakes. I want them to learn that, that uh, I want them to love their country. And it's like, yeah, that's why in 2001, we're all just staring at the Twin Towers, wondering what, you know, with our mouths open, like what the hell happened? Because we're not teaching about American foreign policy, right? So you need someone like, you need someone like me in his life to see, are you sure about this? Like, let's think this through. And I need someone in my life when I'm stuck, you know, with uh, with my other colleagues in academia all day long to have someone like, well, do you remember when the army and this happened? Like, that's why we do it that way and not another way. Right. So mm. that's that is, I think that's important. I think the Stoics understood about how these different types of characters developed because you can have a you can have a different character and still be a scumbag. Right. But de- a developed type of character from wherever you are, you still find overlap with other people. Other people are still in your circles and you can de- develop the kind of character that even if you're more one way or more or the other, where you you still look Accept that these people in your circles and you develop your character from how you treat them as well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, can I just clarify yeah, please something? jump in, Kai. And then yeah, I think so once, you've once got... you're done with your thoughts, I'm going to bring everybody yeah. else here. And we'll... I just wanted to clarify so when someone's made of, say, clay, it doesn't mean they're easily like twisted into a different shape. It's like it's just easy. They just need different, you know, if you're going to all metaphors break down, but to say they might need a little odd prod. Whereas with Leonidas, I had to smack him quite hard to get him to like, come on, work with me. And like it took a hard hit, right? So I had to use a slightly different tool or a bit of a harder hitting tool. Right. And so it's not like if you're clay, it's like, oh, it's easy. Everybody can just like you know manipulate you in an easy way. No, it's just that you are able to manipulate yourself into the mold of reason it's not saying that other people can manipulate you. so you might think because always you'll think oh the guy with the granite is like he's really hard he's unmoving but he, what we were saying is so unmoving that he's not willing to fit into the shape that the logos has prepared for him mm. right mm. and that doesn't mean that leonidas didn't get there it just took a lot of headbutting and a lot of hammering and a lot of chiseling whereas i think with me he could just you know i'm not saying i'm completely clay but it was easier because i was like well i'm you know you're more like uh, solitary, you're very independent. So getting you to, you know, where we want to go is hard work. Whereas with you, it's like, okay, you, he might be like, okay, Kyle, let me just you know, snip here and cut there and let me do that. But okay, you're still looking a bit fluffy around the edges, right? Whereas if I say he would knock there, he would fit in, like it took a big hit, but then he fits in quite, you know, it might be a very sort of like one process, finally got it, in they go. Whereas me, it's like, okay, let me just go around the edges. So it's not to say that, Okay, so he's you know there's there's nothing we can, we can't save you. It's more like we'll recognize who you're working with, and we know that. I mean, Leo, you are stubborn. Let's be honest. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know me, sir. <laughs> so other people are, are not so, but you know, it, it's not that. Oh, I'm you know I'm granite, and therefore I'm lost. No, you also you know be, being partly granite. I mean, if you if, to be fair, if you fit in really sort of nicely, people can stand on you a lot easier because you're solid, right? But you need people that are softer and can help you know help around the edges so i think logos you know is wonderful and says like there is a shape for you like we all should be like granite when it comes to you know people just trying to knock us off from reason but the sharpest blade is reason so if if you allow yourself to be cut with that blade that's how your shape would fit and so i don't want everybody to think oh i'm a granite there's nothing i can do (laughs) oh i'm a clay oh you know it's just easy to manipulate me no it's can you put yourself into that muck how is it? Is it for you? Because you're the only person who can change you. That's what the stakes say, because you're only in control of your actions, your attitudes and your thoughts. So even if other people can try to influence you, even if other people have tools around you, you ultimately have to accept being smacked you know, by a hammer. Mm. Leo had to say, OK, fine. Right. You've got me. You've won. Whatever, you know, whatever joke we, we would play. So it's not a case of, OK, so I just let other people do what they want. Because in stoicism, that doesn't work. That you, People can influence. Like we can know aspects of the future, but we can't know it all. We can mm. have insights to the past, but we can't let the past define us because then it's become our present, right? So then the past doesn't literally define us in that sense. So I didn't want other people to think, oh, that means that other people can manipulate me. And so they really can't if you are standing firm in reason. It's only mm. the blade of reason that can really shape you. But it's how, you know, how easy, how strong does that blade have to be in, in some respects? Just wanted mm. to clarify that some in case other people are feeling like, oh, I can't, you know, I can't. I can't possibly change because I'm granite. I don't want people to think that. It's going to be harder. It's yeah. going to be tougher. You're just going to have to hit harder. That's okay. Yeah, well, I think, I think you know, we, we also, I, you might be um, potentially trying to be kind to people by not just saying some people are just really hard-minded or some people are way more malleable. Like, I, I think I'm, I, like, for me, example, I, 
I think I'm willing to admit that I've got a pretty malleable mind in terms of um, I can probably be influenced a lot easier than a lot of people, right? <laughs> you know, well, which which might show you why, you know, I read Seneca's letters and then all of a sudden turned myself into some sort of stoic guru and started a podcast about it. It's like, you know, I was influenced by Seneca. He really, like he really, you know, he didn't have to work too hard to get me to think, oh, I want to be a stoic, you know. Now I'm trying to rectify that youthful naivety, right? Um, you know, but but I recognize that, you know, although I've done a lot of sales work in my life, I've had a lot of sales work done on me, you know, and, and it's it's worked. And I think it, there's strengths and weaknesses to both things. Like, you know, hey, if if you if you're interested in ideas like, you know, like I'm like you guys are. If you're interested in um, uh, the the progress of your character towards uh, towards um, better places, you know it's like you want to be a little bit malleable and and perhaps not um, so hard minded about things. But I think what you are saying here can help us to think. Okay, well, who am I dealing with here? If I have something that I'm trying to impart on another person, am I dealing with somebody who's very hard minded? And I need to take a different approach. You know, like Marcus Aurelius, he said, if I can't. I can't, I'm going to paraphrase massively here, but if I can't teach somebody that what they're doing is wrong, then that's on me, right? So he might have had this very view where it's like, okay, well, some people are going to be easier to convince. Some people are going to be like really hard. I need to know that because then I've got my the right intel going into this battle. If you see it like that, it's not a battle, but you know what I mean. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna let everybody else come in here now and join the discussion. Um, I think what's been really cool about this discussion so far is. Um, you know, we could have taken this in a in a very kind of standard personal development practical way of like, here's what you do to develop your character. But I think we just dive straight into the, you know, heavy metaphysical, <laughs> you know, aspects of how Stokes saw the, 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 um, the, the character. So now we can continue that discussion here. Um, for everybody who's listening at home, uh, feel free to jump over to patreon.com forward slash Simon J E Drew to get the rest of this conversation. Hey there, YouTubers. I just wanted to let you know that if you love this episode and you'd like many more just like it, then you can head to patreon.com forward slash Simon J E Drew. There you'll get access to exclusive episodes that haven't been released yet, as well as many other benefits. Also, if you'd like to work one-on-one with me in my coaching practice, then you can head to simonjedrew.com forward slash coaching. Talk to you soon.